Hello and welcome to earlymusicsources.com. My name is Elam Rotem, and today we'll make a tutorial on the one thing that instrumentalists in the late Renaissance did all the time, intabulating vocal music. In the 16th century, a great part of the repertoire of plucked and keyboard instruments was not instrumental music originally, but simply adaptations or arrangements of polyphonic vocal music. However, transferring the intricate complexity of polyphony, often for five and six voices onto one instrument, played by only two hands, is not always easy. In this episode, we will focus specifically on how to intabulate music into the Italian keyboard intavolatura, following the only treatise that touches on the subject. Let's start. In an episode dedicated to the concept of intabulations in general, we presented the different notation systems used for different instruments in different places. As we said, on this occasion, we will focus on the Italian keyboard intavolatura. Probably the earliest publication of music with this notation system is from 1517, and it consists of intabulations of frottole, popular secular songs predating the slightly more serious madrigal genre. These adaptations, like many others to follow, were not a simple transfer of the vocal notes to the keyboard. They included a slight rearrangement of the music to fit the idiomatic nature of the instrument, as well as ornaments and diminutions. Many authors from the time, be it in the context of plucked or keyboard instruments, regarded the act of intabulation of vocal music as an art that should take into account both the science of music and the act of playing. During the 16th century, although some purely instrumental genres were introduced, intabulated vocal music was an important part of the repertoire of keyboard players and an almost endless source of new music for them. In Italy, the sole source that instructs keyboard players how to create intabulations was published in 1609. It is found in the second part of Girolamo di Ruta's treatise titled Il Transilvano. Having taught the basics of music for keyboardists, fingering, ornamentation, and such in the first book, di Ruta opens his second book with a section entitled The True Manner and Method of Intabulating Every Vocal Piece. As a first step, he recommends that you put the piece you want to intabulate into a score, putting the two staffs of the keyboard intavolatura under the score, a five-line staff for the right hand and an eight-line staff for the left hand. There were different standards for the number of lines in the left hand, but generally it had more than the right hand and included two clefs as an aid in orientation. For a start, we will intabulate a very simple four-part segment taken from Diego Ortiz's pieces for viola de gamba and harpsichord. We will copy his four-part harpsichord accompaniment onto our score, and following De Ruta's instructions, we will divide it into measures of two semibreves. While adding bar lines is a completely normal thing for us, in De Ruta's time, individual parts were normally without them. The next stage, according to Diruta, is copying the soprano part in the right hand with the stems upwards and the bass part in the left hand with the stems downwards. Regarding the notes of the left hand, Diruta comments, I caution you to place the notes right under those of the soprano. Again, this comment might seem redundant to us, but in Diruta's time, intabulations were the only notation system that at least tried to align notes vertically with one another, even if it was sometimes only partially successful due to printing difficulties. Once the outer voices have been intabulated, Diruta goes on to add the tenor above the bass, noting that its notes should result in one of the following consonances, unison, third, fifth, sixth, or octave. For context, you should know that it's only in the following chapters, after teaching how to intabulate, that Diruta teaches the rules of counterpoint, what intervals are consonant and dissonant, etc. So by adding this comment at this point, Diruta gives the intabulator, who still doesn't know counterpoint, an important tip 
for how to check whether the intabulation process is going well or not. And by inspecting this during the process of intabulating, the intabulator slowly becomes better at counterpoint, even if the only thing they know at this point are the consonances. After the tenor, Diruta adds the alto, noting that both the tenor and alto should be intabulated in the left hand, unless they are distant from the bass by more than an octave, in which case they should be put in the right hand, like this one E, for example. Now you clearly see why the left hand needs more than five lines. We can only guess about the reason for having the voices divided between the hands in this manner, but regardless, having the left hand carry the heavy load was the norm, and it is confirmed in many intavolatura sources. The following comment by Diruta is extremely important. It should also be pointed out that sometimes the tenor passes underneath the bass. This comment holds within it the unfortunate fact that Diruta's simple instruction of copying the soprano as the top part and the bass as the lowest part is not the full picture. In Renaissance polyphony, often the alto might go above the soprano and thus constitute the top part. Similarly, in the lower voices, the tenor might find itself acting as the lowest voice, either because it went below the bass or because the bass had a rest. And so, as you can see in this generic example, when we intabulate, we should first create a top part which constitutes the highest part at every given moment, and a low part which constitutes the lowest part at every given moment. And only then we should add the inner parts. In an Italian manuscript from the late 16th century, we have a nice example of just that. We see an intabulation of the famous madrigal Vesti vai Colli by Palestrina. Having only the top and lowest part, it is unclear whether this is an incomplete intabulation, where the process was stopped just before adding the inner parts, or that it was perhaps intentional, writing out only the outer voices for the learned keyboard players, demanding of them that they add the inner parts according to their skills. Regardless, as we can see in this comparison of the modern transcription with the original five-part madrigal, it's clear how these outer voices were built. The top line of the intabulation, in this case, is identical to the top line of the composition, but the lower part is a compound bass line, made up of the lowest sounding note at every given moment. It is by using this exact technique that the so-called basso seguente parts were created. Many polyphonic pieces were published with just such a bass as an accompanying part, to which skilled players would add upper parts, which hopefully would not contradict the composition. Basso seguente is of course very much related to basso continuo. In many cases, it's just the same thing. But we are moving away from our subject. Let's get back to talking about intabulations. As you have seen, the intavolatura is not, and in fact cannot, preserve the complete polyphonic structure. Often, it's impossible to see where each voice goes. It is not really made for that. It is made so that the keyboard player will press the right key at the right moment. Let's see. The loss of polyphonic information in intabulation is especially noticeable in the extremely common case of voice crossings. It may happen, for example, when there is a canon at the unison, that is, when a certain melody is repeated by one or more voices, as in this example. You see, when we intabulate all these lines together, we effectively mash them down in such a way that it's impossible to see the original lines. It's really like changing from three dimensions to two dimensions. To be fair, it also sounds like that when played on one instrument. For the stem directions, I followed Diruta's principles. Whatever note is on top gets the stem upwards, and whatever is on the bottom gets the stem downwards. Also, according to Diruta, I avoided adding any unnecessary rests. He writes that once there are some notes on a staff, it is mostly not necessary to indicate rests of the other parts. 
lest they crowd the notes. As you see, in Diruta's principles, there is a sense of clearness and cleanness, the inclusion of only the relevant information for the execution of the music. Compare this to modern notation standards, preserving a specific stem direction for each voice and including all the rests of all the voices. The outcome is not necessarily better or clearer. It is still very hard to see the original voices, and the score is just a bit more messy. Needless to say that I am not saying that a certain system is better than another. It is more to demonstrate the challenges that come with arranging Renaissance polyphony for a single instrument. In this example, you can see how this perfectly correct contrapuntal progression might seem wrong when intabulated. The original and correct voice leading is obscured, and we are left with what seems like blatant parallel octaves and fifths. In one of the earliest instructions for realizing basso continuo, Ludovico Viadana writes that it is not always necessary to avoid parallel fifths or octaves in the realization. Only the composed parts should avoid them. Here you see exactly what he meant. The polyphony that you play should be correct, but the seemingly wrong result of the mashed voices is not a problem in his opinion. Seeing the difficulties of the Italian intavolatura in conveying the individual voices, it is easy to understand why genres that include complicated counterpoints such as ricercari and canzoni were mostly printed in partitura, a full score. The German composer Samuel Scheidt, who published his music in partitura format, wrote that he did so because in the intavolatura notation the parts crossed one another so awkwardly to the extent that it's not possible for the reader to understand which voice is which. So, after seeing the principles of intabulation, let's try to intabulate some things. In a Spanish treatise from the middle of the 16th century by Juan Bermudo, dealing, among other things, with intabulating vocal music to the vihuela, he recommends beginning with the intabulation of simple homophonic pieces for two or three voices. Following his advice, I googled some villanelle, a popular Neapolitan genre which is known for its simplicity. I stumbled upon a collection from 1574, chose a piece by a composer I had never heard of, and following Diruta's instructions, I first put it in a score. Not to be confused with the seeming parallels that we discussed earlier, the villanelle, as you can see, are notorious for having actual parallels between the voices, something that was not accepted in genres that were considered more serious. Anyway, let's go on with the intabulation. We put the highest notes of the composition, which happen to be in this case simply the top line in the right hand, and the lowest notes, which happen to be simply the bass line in the left hand. Then we add the middle voice in accordance with its distance from the bass. If it's within an octave, it should be in the left hand. And we are done. There was only one case in which I chose to put the alto line in the right hand against the norm. This was because its quick movement is together with that of the right hand, and it's much easier to play like this. Following the principles of minimalism in notation, whenever two voices are playing the same note, as only one key is struck, only one note is reflected in the notation. Since the piece is so short, I'll play it for you. It's very simple, but definitely a nice and historical way to render a piece. For a slightly more advanced piece, we will take the beloved four-part French chanson Douce Memoire by Pierre Sandran. Here it is already in score without the text, and now we will quickly intabulate it, putting the highest notes of the piece in the right hand with the stems up, 
and the lowest notes of the piece in the left hand with the stems down. Notice that when the bass has a rest, the tenor, in effect, is the lowest note. Now we'll add the inner voices in accordance with their distance from the bass, and find out, again, that almost all the notes should be played in the left hand. Notice how in the fourth bar the tenor is higher than the alto, but this cannot be represented in the intabulation. In the fifth bar, I decided to skip the holding of the dotted C of the alto. With singers it sounds great, but on the keyboard it sounds a bit like a mistake, in my opinion. As you may gather, intabulation is not really a science. It's about finding the best way to transfer a vocal piece to a specific instrumental medium. Vincenzo Galilei, who might be the writer who wrote the most about intabulating, in his case for the lute, explained that the intabulator must use their judgment and taste during the process, to decide, for example, whether some long notes might be divided and restruck, to decide whether some composed note repetitions were actually needed, or only added because of some compositional necessity, in this case they may be omitted, to decide which notes should be played in cases where there are just too many voices and it's not possible to play all of them, and lastly, to decide which notes to keep and which to omit in order to make the imitations inside the piece most audible and clear. Back to our Douce Memoire. We can definitely play our intabulation as it is and enjoy this beautiful song, even if some of the polyphonic details got a bit lost in translation. However, great instrumentalists from Diruta's era, be it lutenists or keyboardists, wouldn't have been satisfied with such an endeavor. Just like singers, they would adorn their intabulations with ornaments and diminutions. Diruta writes, Intabulation with diminutions is an art of the highest discernment and good taste, in which one seeks to be both a good singer and a good contrapuntist. In order to teach this art, Diruta first generally recommends that the readers look at the work of great composers, such as Claudio Merulo, who, more than any other man, has outdone himself in this fine art of intabulations with diminutions. Then, for simplicity's sake, he suggests focusing on five kinds of diminutions or ornaments. Minuta, gruppi, tremoli, clamazioni, and accenti. Minuta are diminutions made up of eighth or sixteenth notes, mostly in stepwise motion, that may appear in each of the voices of a composition. In Diruta's demonstration, he took a simple four-part progression and demonstrated how it may be intabulated with minuta in the different voices. The other ornaments, gruppi, tremoli, clamazioni, and accenti, are found, albeit under different names and slight variations, in several other sources from that time. Before presenting two pieces that he intabulated with diminutions, he explains when diminutions are appropriate and when not. They are great, for example, in sections where a few or all of the parts move together, but are not desired in sections with imitations. He notes, however, that if you do want to add diminutions on some subject which is imitated, you must add the same diminution in all the voices. The first piece of his examples, he writes, is in quick notes and has stretto imitations. One who would want to embellish it would only take away from its charm. You cannot use any diminutions except tremoli and gruppi. You are welcome to check in detail the PDF of this comparative score yourself, link in the footnotes page. You'll see all the things we talked about, how the top part of the intabulation is always made up with the highest voice at any given moment, and how the low part is always made with the lowest voice at any given moment. You will also see how Diruta decided to restrike some long notes, and how he added some accidentals, and disregarded others. But the most striking thing about this intabulation is the fact that while it was made in order to demonstrate how to add diminutions, added diminutions are only found in three bars out of 46. Otherwise, the voices are replicated quite literally. Diruta really wanted to make a point that in such pieces with quick imitations, you should add diminutions only when they are appropriate, even if it's minimal.
the second piece that he demonstrates has quite a lot of diminutions, and he marks each one with a letter according to their name. As you see, also this piece includes imitations, but it is not as quick as the former one, and as Diruta suggests, if all the subjects are ornamented in the same way, it's okay, presumably because the effect of imitation is preserved. If you want, you can also get the PDF of this transcription and check it out in detail. We won't play this now. Instead, we'll go back to our Douce Memoire and try to add our own diminutions in the spirit of Diruta. Like Diruta, I will mark the ornaments. Let's listen. <laughs> so on and so on. The rest you can intabulate by yourself. This was our episode about intabulating polyphonic music for keyboard according to Diruta. We hope you enjoyed it. Many thanks to Augusta Campagne who helped me write this episode. Don't forget to check the special page on our website with all the footnotes and other extra information. If you enjoy early music sources, consider supporting it on Patreon. Comment, share and like. See you next time at earlymusicsources.com.